<laughs> All right, well, thanks very much for having me. Um, and I'm actually breaking, I think, two of the rules. So both of the rules of the event, because it's not a paper, but it's a book. It's even a pretty thick book, but it's worth it. And the other rule is it's not a computer science book. Um, but I think it's still, it's still really interesting because there's sort of lots of implications that the ideas from the book can have about on, on how we talk about computer science and how we think about computer science. Um, and um, I guess the, the sort of how I got interested in this topic is that uh, my background is I did PhD in programming languages and um, it was um, in the fairly theoretical sort of type system and proving things about lambda calculus kind of, kind of world. Um, and there you're working with these very abstract entities and you're somehow feeling that they're the real truth about the universe. And you're, you're discovering the, the, the real truth, not the people who actually write code and do useful things. Um, and I think this is, this is one, of the, one of the sort of different approaches to, to trying to come up with where mathematics comes from and where the sort of more abstract thinking comes from. How can we explain it? Is it really, is it really the true sort of um, the true nature of the universe, or is it somehow just a humanly construction? Um, so, uh, why does this matter, um, and how does the how does the book actually work? Um, so, I think there's a couple of interesting questions that. Um, People will mention every now and then. Um, so, where if, if you look at arithmetic, there are some usual laws like associativity, commutativity, that also happen to be very useful in programming. Uh, but where do these things come from? Why do we require that monoids are commutative and have a unit uh, associated? Or another question you might ask, and this is actually a real, real question that someone asked on Quora, would aliens have lambda calculus? So if we want to talk to aliens, should we just write lambda calculus to them because that's the universal truth and they will understand it and don't bother them with this like plaque with the picture of a human and some stars because they would represent them differently. Um, Another sort of question that I think is really interesting is why is it that mathematics is actually capable of sort of modeling physical world and why, why do I, why can I take some physics equations, put them together using laws of algebra and it will model the world. Um, and the sort of other question that I think gets briefly mentioned in the book is, is mathematics really this sort of um, very elitist um, subject, or should, should we talk about it differently so that more people can explain, can understand it? Um, and what I think is really so, what the book really does is that it tries to apply uh, the ideas from cognitive sciences to mathematics. And um, there's two key ideas. Um, one is that the only mathematics we have. And the only mathematics we know is the mathematics that happens because of brain, uh, brain and mind. So because humans have brain and mind, that's how the mathematics happens. And um, it's up to the cognitive sciences and their sciences to up apply the science of mind to human mathematical ideas. So the, the idea of the book is Mathematics happens in, in human minds and brains somehow, and cognitive science is a, one of the sort of options for studying how this happens. And there's a couple of things in, in cognitive sciences where um, sort of cognitive sciences are trying to understand how human brains work. There's the sort of neuroscience aspects of it where you can actually measure some things about how different brain brain parts get activated, that's one source. The other is sort of analyzing 
um, different aspects of um, how human cognition gets, gets represented. So for example, you can look at how people talk about things and understand what metaphors they're using for thinking. Um, and um, the book is sort of looking at mathematics at a couple of different levels. So the first fun part um, is innate arithmetic, which is sort of briefly mentioned, and there's more papers you can read. But there's actually neuroscientific evidence that very small babies actually do have some mathematical capabilities. And I'll say a few more things about this later. If you have babies, there are fun experiments you can make. Um, but you need an eye tracker and 50 babies. <laughs> that are not fussy. Um, the, the other thing is that um, a lot of the um, sort of, or one of the key ideas in cognitive sciences is that a lot of thinking happens through metaphorical thinking. So um, we tend to ex talk about or understand very abstract things in terms of more concrete things. And um, the book talks about a couple of conceptual metaphors or grounding metaphors that link some basic mathematical stuff with things that we know from the world. Um, and the other component is sort of going towards more abstract level, where um, at the more abstract level, um, we are sort of building up the metaphors further and further. And um, so you would have a basic metaphor that links some stuff in the world with maybe arithmetic and numbers. And then you would have an ad additional layer that links the numbers with other things more in the sort of abstract, abstract space. So. Um, so this is the fun experiment you can do with babies. Um, I think the paper did it with five month old babies. Um, and it's, an evi it's a basic evidence that babies can actually subtract. So the, the trick here is you would have so you need this fairly sophisticated setup where you have some objects, in this case it's the Mickey Mouse, and uh, you can cover it partly. Um, so what's happening here is that you put in two Mickey Mouses, then you cover them, and then an empty hand enters the space, you take one of the Mickey Mouses and take it away. And then there's then you measure what happens with the baby based on two possible outcomes. One is the expected thing, so the screen drops and there's just one Mickey Mouse there. Um, or you can do an impossible or unexpected outcome where the screen drops and there's still two Mickey Mouses there. Because you have some hidden trap door in the bottom and you stick in the other Mickey Mouse. So there's still two of them. And the experiment is basically doing, is basically tracking how long does the baby stare at the screen after you do this? And the, exp the, the, the results are that if the impossible thing happens, the babies will stare at it for longer because they're confused. And if the expected thing happens, then they'll just sort of say, yeah, whatever, and then start fussing. And um, people have done various experiments like this. Um, and I think they're sort of empirical evidence that Babies can subtract and add um, numbers less than four. And once you get to four or five, they sort of just don't care because they don't see the difference between five, four and five. So there's some built-in arithmetics on very small numbers that um, humans do actually have without even having to study anything. Um, and that's, the sort, that's one of the sort of basic foundational things that, that um, we know. The other thing that um, is sort of very much the focus on, of the book is the various metaphors that people use to explain the abstract mathematical ideas or construct the abstract mathematical ideas in terms of the concrete physical stuff in the world. Um, so, 
the central idea is that um, one, of the, one of the principal results in cognitive sciences is that abstract concepts are typically understood by metaphors in terms of more concrete concepts. Um, and that's sort of another aspect of cognitive sciences that um, are sort of taken for granted. There's more references if you're interested in the experiments that confirm this. But um, this is the, the central principle. And then from this, once we, once we know this, we can look at what the metaphors that link the concrete to the abstract are and um, what are the concrete metaphors that let us explain some abstract concepts in, in uh, mathematics. Um, and as I'm saying, the key thing is that mathematical ideas, even though they're sort of abstract and has to have this aura of perfection, they're really just grounded in everyday experience. Um, and um, a, a little example is of, of a mathematical idea that is sort of mathematis mathematization of, a, of something in the ordinary world is that if you look at derivatives in mathematics, they're a mathematization of um, instantaneous change. So change of sort of idea that derivatives talk about speed and so on. That's, that's one kind of metaphor that people will, um, even without thinking about it, use to sort of think about derivatives. Um, so, the sort of more technical parts of the book are looking at the different concrete metaphors, and there's two kinds of them. Grounding metaphor, which is where you say, um, for example, mathematical sets are just like physical containers, like boxes containing apples and so on. And then there's the linking metaphors where you can um, link things that you already constructed with more things you're constructing. So you can say, uh, if you say numbers are like sets, or you can encode numbers by a set, where zero will be the empty set, one will be a set containing the empty set, and so on. Then that's something that they call a linking metaphor, where once you constructed numbers from your apples in containers, you can take the next step and continue building building mathematics based from what you know from the world. Um, and the really interesting thing that's happening is that when you're using the metaphors, some um, stuff from the concrete world will get introduced to the <coughs> to the abstract world. So when you say um, numbers are like apples, then numbers are like apples in a box, then as you're adding apples to a box, it actually sort of follows some basic properties. So if you, if you have two apples in a box and you add one apple, it's the same like having one apple in a box and adding two apples, and that's one of the sort of physical world properties that gets propagated to properties about mathematics. So, um, there's a couple of things I want to talk about a bit more, and um, one of the chapters that I think is sort of nice illustration of the idea fairly, fairly at the beginning of the book, so if you start um, getting to this point, it's, it's fairly doable. Um, the, the chapter is about the different metaphors that explain basic arithmetic. Um, and there's a couple of different metaphors that are sort of used, or that people ordinarily use. Um, and um, three of them are that arithmetic works like collection of objects. So this was the idea with the sort of apples in a container or any other object in any other container. Um, that's the object collection metaphor. The other one is object construction. So rather than sort of talking about what is in a box, you're saying how you add stuff together to build something. Um, the, the third one that I think is sort of 
I think that the object construction, I find it slightly confusing because it's very similar to the first one. But the third one is another very different way of thinking about, about mathematics where you're, you're sort of imagine that numbers are points at the path and um, the various mathematical operations represent moving along this, this path or along this line. Um, and then with all these sort of concrete, physical, real-world metaphors, the different arithmetic laws will come from the physical experience of actually moving things along the path, or, I don't know, cycling around, um, or adding stuff to a box. Um, so this is, this is a sort of concrete example from the book that illustrates one of the metaphors um, where the, the source domain is this collection of objects in a, in a physical world and the target domain is uh, mathematics and um, numbers and, and operations on numbers. So here um, the um, collections of objects for example, apples in a box will represent numbers, um, and um, the size of the collection is the, the value of the number. Whether the collection is bigger or smaller corresponds to whether the number is greater or, or less. Um, the smallest collection, collection is a collection with one thing in it. Um, putting collections together means addition, and taking something from the box Will, will be subtraction. Um, and um, I think this is, this is something that sort of sounds very uninteresting in a way when you think about it because you're like, well, sure, number small collections um, or number small things in the box, that's, that's not really cool. But um, I think it's sort of, I, I think it's uninteresting when you think about it just as an application of mathematics. And it gets more interesting when you treat this as what actually creates the mathematics. So um, it's not that this is saying, well, you can model boxes as numbers, but it's saying this is actually how the arithmetic gets created. This is how we, how we build this mathematical world in, in our brain. Um, and it's really just sort of interacting with the physical world, seeing what happens there, and building up some um, obstructions um, that happen to correspond to what's in the world. So this um, sort of arithmetic is an is a object collection metaphor is one. Um, it has some interesting properties. So the one interesting thing, and that's also and sort of additional evidence that that's how we actually think about uh, about um, mathematics is that there's uh, lots of cases where the language we use to talk about numbers and objects in a collection coincides. So we will say add onions and carrots to the soup, um, which is doing stuff in the in the physical world, but we actually use the same language to talk about numbers when we are adding numbers. Or if you say, which is bigger, five or seven, um, you're <coughs> using something that you would use for sort of size of things in the physical world to talk about uh, something in mathematics where um, you wouldn't normally, like even the formalizations of mathematics wouldn't typically use the word bigger. Um, it sort of fits well with the equational properties, so uh, the, the laws of arithmetics really come from sort of fiddling with stuff and containers. Um, so this is an example of the associativity rule, but lots of, lots of other rules will sort of work in the same way. Um, it does have some interesting limitations, so if you're thinking about um, stuff in a container, um, there's no sort of easily understandable natural zero because you never have a box containing zero apples or you don't have a box containing zero oranges. Um, and so one of, the, one of the things that people will do is um, 
maybe cross-link the multiple different metaphors and sort of artificially come up with this concept like box containing zero, zero apples. Um, so question, do you think that box containing zero apples is the same as box containing zero oranges? <laughs> Who thinks they're the same? <laughs> no? Who thinks they're different? Ah, a few different. <laughs> Well, I think if I show you two boxes, then you would say they're the same, but because you're uh, people working in, in nicely typed languages, you know that this is a type error. But now I think this is, this is one of the sort of cases where you have to stretch the metaphor, and um, we've evolved very good ways of doing it that sometimes leads to very surprising results, like two boxes that are the same, aren't the same. So another, another, the, the second metaphor that I'll talk more about is this idea that arithmetic is like motion along the path. And in this case, um, you imagine we have some path um, and um, the different moves, different sort of ways of moving along the path will cor correspond to different arithmetic operations. Um, how far you are along the path, that's what will represent um, the result or a, a number um, and interestingly this doesn't have problems with zero because if you are on a path and you don't move you've, you're at the point zero um, you have to imagine there's some unit so maybe one step or, or something um, or maybe one day on a horse whatever <laughs> um, that's, a, that's your unit and then if you're further from the origin this is a greater number, if you're closer, it's a smaller number. Um, and again, if you sort of transform your origin and you start somewhere, move a bit, and then imagining this is the end, move by another number, that's representing addition. And again, this is a sort of very physical, real world uh, concept, something that we experience that happens to model a lot of basic arithmetic ideas. So again, this is something that we, we use the metaphor when talking about numbers, because you can say 4.9 is near 5. And how is 4.9 near 5? Um, they're sort of near if you imagine they're on a path, but um, if you treat them just like abstract concepts that are given to us by um, Plato, then there's no sort of nearness. Or result is around 42 as another example where we're using physical motion along the path metaphor to talk about to talk about mathematics. Um, and this one is quite nice because it deals with zero. It also can explain fractions. So if you say sort of one third, that's really um, Move, move along the path so far such that if you do it three times you will reach the, the unit. Um, so this, this has um, a couple of nice features in explaining other mathematical aspects that may don't work quite well in some of the other metaphors. Enough to illustrate that there is some sense in looking at these different physical real world metaphors and linking what we do, uh, what happens in the, in the physical world with um, things that we would normally see as abstract mathematical ideas, um, even though arithmetic is a fairly concrete one. So um, I think this is, this is sort of a nice example showing that if you, if you will accept that really the mathematics we have the only way to study it is to look at how, from our bodily experience and from our um, sort of what the brain does, cons to cons uh, if, we, if we say that um, this is how we can understand mathematics, then we can look at all these different metaphors and see how they will let us construct things like arithmetics. Um, now, what sort of I guess the, the thick part of the book is looking at a couple of different um, 
ideas beyond just simple arithmetic. So how can we use these, this way of sort of reconstructing or analyzing mathematics to understand things like infinity or Boolean algebra or sets? Um, and the case study at the end looks at this famous <coughs> equation um, that sort of links quite a lot of different things together. Um, so um, I'll say a few more words about the infinity. Um, and the equation that I was mentioning, that one is interesting because um, it sort of links lots of physical real world concepts like rotation uh, with some abstract, some more abstracted ideas where sort of exponential, exponentiation is a way of treating multiplication as addition, which are things that you can explain in terms of the basic arithmetic metaphors. Um, and you can sort of, if you think about it hard enough, you can interpret this as some sort of metaphorical construction about things happening in the world. Um, and the other thing that I find quite nice, or quite sort of um, hilarious, especially for someone who spent four years doing theoretical algebraic programming languages stuff, is how you can actually come up with this idea of algebras, um, where um, a lot of it is based on our sort of um, folk understanding of what essences and substances and forms are, which is something that goes very far, very far back to the ancient Greeks in the, in the sort of Western world. Um, so there, there are just different examples of things you can try to explain in this way. Um, sadly, the book is really just about these interesting mathematical ideas, but it doesn't tell you how uh, the lambda calculus or how monads are um, are uh, experienced in terms of burritos. Um, so, but, uh, I think another interesting one that I wanted to mention just briefly is the infinity. So, how do we actually get this sort of... Like, infinity is interesting because you never really experience infinity. Um, it's not like, well, unless you're waiting for a train. Um, in the UK. In the UK. Um, but infinity is, is really something that sort of you can't experience truly in the, in the world. So how is it, how can we explain it in this metaphorical sense? Um, and the key idea here is that um, this is sort of taking one more step where we, are, we get to infinity by thinking about processes and by linking process that has a couple of iterations and eventually finishes with a process that uh, never, never, never completes and goes on and on. Um, so this is another, another metaphor where on the left is the process that uh, does a couple of steps and finishes, and on the right we have an iterative process that goes on and on, and they both have beginning state. Um, the state resulting from the initial stage, well that's just the beginning state, I guess. Um, the, the process, so for a given intermediate state, produce the next state, which is the same for both processes that end and processes that don't end. Um, you can have intermediate result after some number of iterations. And then the interesting bit is at the end, where the process that finishes has the final resulting state. And the iterative process, if you think about it normally, wouldn't have that. But as you link them through the metaphor, the metaphor sort of lets you take ideas from the source to the target. So the metaphor is what you, what you will use to, get, to come up with this idea that the iterative process that goes on and on would have some completing state because all the other things match. So you sort of imagine what would it be if it was here as well. And that's how, that's how we get to understand or think about 
um, actual infinity as the, as the end of the process that never finishes. Um, and yes, the, the final resulting state is unique and follows every non-final state, which is again sort of here is defining property of the infinity, here it's just the property of the process. So this is where the, the linking metaphor between two different things gets used to create or sort of to take something from one concrete domain into the other domain where it has some new unexpected meaning. Um, yes, so this is, this is what I was just saying. Um, and I think this is really, really interesting idea because if you um, try to understand this sort of metaphors that link different concepts, you can actually see where we are transforming one idea where, from one domain where it means something to another domain where we actually have to sort of imagine there's something there. Um, and it explains how we can think about um, actual infinity, which is something we never really um, experience in the real world. And then you can, um, so, so Lakoff and Nunes call this the, the basic metaphor of infinity, and then you can use this to explain lots of other, um, lots of other things where we talk about infinity in mathematics. For example, when we say um, that parallel lines meet at infinity, so that's the idea you have sort of triangles and uh, bigger triangles and bigger triangles. And if you imagine the angles here are 90 and 90 degrees, then you have parallel lines. But in, in projective geometry, people think about the lines, the parallel lines meeting in, in the infinity. And that's again something that you can explain by linking to the, to the metaphor um, where um, the triangle, where the triangle that looks like this is the sort of beginning state. As you keep increasing the angle, you will keep getting wider and wider triangles, and the, the third point will get further and further away. Um, and eventually, if you imagine you reach the end where it's fully open, that's where we get to the final resulting state, and that's where, by sort of metaphors, we imagine the triangle is infinitely long and the, the, the parallel lines do meet at this infinity point. Um, so I'm not really going to talk too much about the other different um, metaphors and about the other different mathematical concepts that get explained in the book. Um, there's plenty of them and that's why the book is so thick. Um, but I think the, the other really interesting sort of aspects of this, of the book that I quite liked, that are sort of scattered around in, in a couple of chapters at the end, is um, what are the sort of implications of this way of thinking about mathematics, or um, is this actually useful for anything? So the, the one thing that the book tries to explain and explain why it's not true, or I'll say more later on, is the Romans of mathematics. So the Romans of mathematics is this idea that mathematics is an objective feature of the universe. It's actually not just that the objective feature of the universe, it's objective feature of all possible universes, just to be sure. Um, produces absolute truths that are true in any possible universe. Um, hence, the aliens will have lambda calculus. Um, it also characterizes the nature of rationality. So if you're thinking, um, you should use this objective thing that happens to hold in all possible universes because that's the only universal way of, of reasoning. Um, and mathematical truths are universal and absolute, and so on. So this is, I think, what um, many people in the theoretical computer science will, will tell you if, if you ask them why do you study lambda calculus, because lambda calculus is this um, absolute truth that you can truly understand. 
Um, and um, what I think is really interesting point of this book is that um, there's no scientific evidence that you can really sort of use to, to say that this is the case. You can believe in this, um, you can also believe in God, you can believe in many other things. Um, the romance of mathematics is just like religion. Um, but if we want to study the, the things that we can actually study through the cognitive sciences, then, um, um, then all we have available is the sort of mathematics constructed from physical world. Um, there might still be perfect, absolute, universal mathematics. Um, there might not. So, um, the, the summary is that the romance of mathematics makes for a wonderful story. It perpetuates the mystique of the mathematician as someone who is more rational, more probing, deeper and visionary. But sadly, for the most part, it's not a true story. Um, and um, it's not a true story because the only way we can actually talk about mathematics is from our sort of brain and, and flesh mathematics that we experience and build up. Um, the other couple of random points around this is that, um, okay, you could say, well, this is sad, um, but maybe sort of if it's, if it's just boxes and apples, then anyone who has boxes and apples will have mathematics. <laughs> That's all right. If the aliens have boxes and stuff to put in them, they'll have mathematics and love that calculus. Um, there's a couple of... And that's sort of, for the most part, I think that's a reasonable thing. There's a couple of aspects of mathematics where it's more dependent on the culture. So, um, the idea of essence, um, everything in the, in the universe has an essence, and since Euclid, essence can be given by a small number of um, obviously true postulates. That's one of the, 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 th the sort of very culture dependent thing that our Western culture has where we think about essence and um, it's, it's something that sort of goes back to, to Euclid but um, um, other cultures on the planet wouldn't necessarily have this idea of essence. So maybe other, other cultures wouldn't necessarily evolve bubble because they wouldn't have this idea that you, sh you can come up with an essence that's objectively more true. Um, the idea that theories like buildings must have secure, solid, and permanent foundations on which all else is built, um, that's at least as old as Aristotle. So again, this is, um, well, this has been the, the governing metaphor behind Western theories that pretends to give an account of certain and absolute knowledge. So again, this idea that we can construct solid foundations um, and give um, absolutely correct knowledge, that's again something that sort of um, is more or less directly evolved from the ancient Greek philosophers. Um, and the whole sort of foundations of mathematics movement uh, around the end of the 19th century, ending with with um, Hilbert and the sort of all the aims to find the foundations of mathematics that later didn't turn out so well. That's uh, that's coming from this sort of cultural tradition. Um, why do I think this is a good problem for computer scientists as well? Well, um, I think there's um, sort of, if you, especially if you look at the more theoretical aspects of computer science, we do really sort of live in the world of um, the romance of theoretical computer science, where um, that gets a lot of, um, or that, that's used to rationalize a lot of, a lot of things in the discipline. Um, the looking at the metaphors and, and trying to do sort of what would cognitive science say about computer science, I think that's interesting for a few reasons. The first is that the metaphors that we are using 
and we do it unconsciously, they really affect how we think about things. Um, so one of the histories that's documented in the book is the discretization program where people started th to think about points and about space in terms of discrete points. So um, if you have a point, then there's the circle around it is all points such that the distance between the points um, is less than something, and so on. Um, th this, is, this is a really interesting change where people sort of stopped thinking about space as something continuous and started thinking about it as a discrete collection of points. Um, and then you can't really ask like when do two points meet or when they touch because that's not in your in your um, vocabulary that you construct when you use a different metaphor. Um, so the metaphors will actually affect what we can think, and it happens occasionally throughout the history of mathematics that people will develop different metaphors and start thinking differently, um, which I think might be helpful thing for computer science in some disciplines. Um, what metaphors? So the, the other thing that I think would be quite fun is to look at some of the um, sort of concepts or, or theories like lambda calculus and monads and actually look what is the, how did we get there or why did we construct it, how did we construct it. Um, and in particular, um, if you, if you um, if you like the idea that lambda calculus and um, some aspects of category theory and logic are all the same and hence they're the true fact about the universe. Um, if we actually looked at the metaphor, we might, find, might be able to find out that they're constructed from very similar sort of physical experience through similar reasoning steps. And then they really are sort of same because they correspond to something important in the world. So to wrap up, um, would aliens understand lambda calculus? Um, I think um, so. I, I took this. Um, who has seen the arrival? <laughs> if you haven't, then uh, yeah, it's really good. It's really it's really good movie. Um, I'm not going to do too many spoilers. <laughs> but the, the sort of, there's some alien race in the in the in the universe that um, I I think wouldn't understand lambda calculus, um, and it's, <laughs> it's based on the sort of world in which they live and how they experience it, which is very different than what humans do. Um, so those aliens wouldn't understand lambda calculus. Um, the sort of as close as you can get to lambda calculus with just this book is that there's, there's a section on logic. So um, one of the interesting ideas there is that um, the sort of rule for logic, a rule for implication where if I have A and A implies B, then I also have B. Um, that can be derived from the idea of containers. So if I have, if I have this uh, remaining um, can of cider, there's cider in the can, and if I put the can under the table, then the cider is also under the table. Now I've done, now I've done uh, beta reduction. Because what I've done is that I've got A, which is my cider, in a no, uh, A is that I've got, I've got um, cider in a, in a can, and um, if I have B, which is that I put the can under the table, then um, the, the implication is putting the can under the table, and then B is my cider is under the table. So this is, this is a bit too silly, but um, the, the sort of property of containers where if you put a container containing something in another container uh, that's something you can do in the physical world and it happens to correspond <coughs> we can use the metaphors to construct from it the, the um, basic sort of modus ponens rule of logic um, and 
uh, that's where the book stops. But if you if you sort of wanted to treat lambda calculus as derived from this, then you would have a couple of more metaphorical steps, and maybe um, maybe that's how we came up with the idea. Um, and the way to understand it would be to look at how sort of early authors wrote about lambda calculus. What was the language they used? Did they talk about sort of um, did they just follow the logic, um, or did they use some other real-world metaphors, and so on? Um, so, if this was the case, then really the question is: Do aliens have have containers? Can they put things in other things? And that might be the case for very sort of reasonable aliens. But if you imagine some aliens that live in a in a universe full of gases where there really is no clear in, then maybe their mathematics would really be very different. So, um, if, if the aliens are pretty much like humans, then maybe they'll have, they'll have all that calculus. Otherwise, probably not. All right, so um, that, was, that was the summary. Um, I think the, really the key point, so if you, if you wanted to remember something from the talk, um, I think it's the, the first bit is that um, this is another way of thinking about the nature of mathematics. You don't have to think about it as this platonic ideal world. You can really understand mathematics by looking at how it's created by humans using the normal brain processes. Um, and that can explain uh, quite a lot about it. Um, it's constructed by a metaphor. So um, there's some sort of grounding metaphors where you really link physical world to the abstract world. And then there's linking metaphors that let you transfer concepts in the more abstract sort of metaphorical sense. And finally, uh, I think understanding and thinking about the metaphors is really important because it sort of is how we unconsciously think about mathematics. But changing the metaphors is something that can happen, and it will change what we can think and how we can think. And that's it. Thank you. So I think we probably have some time for questions. Absolutely, yes. We can, I can take a few questions while standing here, and a few more questions while standing somewhere over there. <laughs> yes? Um, so, like, Thank you. Like, I definitely have uh, an affair with mathematics such as Solomon's, and this is a bit challenging to a lot of my thought processes and how I see a lot of things. So, two questions basically. So, the way I understand like relativity and Einstein is that he was saying the laws of physics do not depend on the observer. And now you're kind of making the the claim that the laws of mathematics can kind of depend on the observer. Mm -hmm. And how would you see and compare those two? And the second thing is. We know like all that Turing machine is basically doing symbol manipulation and mm -hmm. syntax. Mm -hmm. And a lot of mathematics could be thought of as just doing yeah. logic and syntax without any semantics to it. Mm -hmm. But we humans attach semantics to a lot of things. And maybe there's a there's something to say about that, maybe there isn't so on. Yeah. So I think on the on the first side, um, I never understood understood physics beyond sort of Newtonian old form, so I don't really have um, probably don't really have anything useful to say. Um, I think all that this is saying is that, and I like I think it's it's sort of um, the book is very much like this is the this is the way to think about mathematics. Um, I think it's sort of useful to think about it as one of the several options because some of the things that they're using are fairly sort of the scientific evidence is pretty reasonable. Some of it gets more um, sort of when you, when you look at how different parts of brain co-activate when you think about something, well maybe that's, that's sort of solid evidence, maybe it's just run them. Um, how it would link to physics, uh, yeah, I don't know. 
I think that the sort of the one example that gets a bit closer to that is that um, why is it that um, that fractals are everywhere in the world? Um, and his answer would be well because we constructed fractals in mathematics by looking at the things in the world. So sort of it's not that um, the, the platonic idea of fractals happens to it came to us and it's beautiful that it explains the world. It's more like, oh, the world looks like this. We try to explain it and we sort of abstractize enough that we come up with fractions. But that's not anywhere close to what you were asking. So, um, What was the other question? Syntax and semantics. Oh, yeah, yeah, syntax and semantics. Um, yeah, that's also a tricky one. So, um, I guess um, the, the, the sort of abstract syntax is still sort of developed from some concrete world-like things. And um, if we sort of pick some axioms like associativity, it's probably because this is how a lot of things in the world works. So if we then um, use the syntax to talk about something else in the world, it's quite likely that the associativity would, make, would have some sense because that's why we came up with it in the first place. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's sort of I think this is this is one of the valid objections that you could make against this. Because to be honest, like the, for me, it's very challenging. Like challenges the way I think, but I'm not yet one hundred percent. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it took me like three years to actually vaguely start believing that this might be sensible. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to following up on the physics. It's not the end of that's my point, but it's a chapter of what the framework makes points about mathematics. It's only a very small part of what's considered beautiful mathematics. Mm -hmm. It applies. Mm -hmm. It turns out to be, you know, the, the phrase, the unreasonable yeah, yeah, yeah. effectiveness of mathematics. Suddenly, you know, a small but beautiful, very often beautiful part of mathematics is suddenly incredibly effective mm -hmm. in, in explaining deep things that we that we don't experience and mm -hmm. do through our instruments. But at least, you know, in the very small already, we, we, we are outside of the experience now. And yet, something that is being attracted, you know, by, by our minds, let's just say, mm -hmm. uh, then to some part of it, and this is the mystery, I think, mm -hmm. some part of it, not all of it, and this big, you know, he would not think, say, a lot of string theory is very useful, Mm -hmm. But he's not convinced. Yeah, yeah. It's doing much to explain the real world because he doesn't, he doesn't go with that particular mm -hmm. fact. But that he may, or may not be right, but I'm sure he's right about the fact it's only a small part of mm -hmm. the sort of body mathematics that human beings have constructed. So I think, I think there's a mystery at the very um, least. And not, you know, the, the experience of mathematicians, because most of us can't go without understanding this stuff, but the experience of mathematicians is, is the some, some part suddenly is incredibly yeah. fruitful in, in explaining the yeah, yeah. very unexpected phenomena that we find in our yeah, instruments. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's, yeah. there's, there's room for yeah. quite a lot of, um, or well, mystery at least. Yeah, yeah. No, I think this, this, this idea that sort of suddenly different parts magically interlink, um, that's something that, um, if, if uh, the authors had a couple of more <coughs> centuries to study it, then they could probably sort of explain or build up a metaphorical understanding of like what was the unconscious sort of metaphorical thinking that leads to these ideas. And it might happen that the two seemingly very different things are actually sort of related to this metaphorical thinking as well, but... Um, I mean, I have no problem with the origins of our, of our maths, you know, coming out of you know, the real world. Yeah. 
to the ASCO. And I was going to know one thing about the sort of, you know, bits of the new branch of mathematics, some of the new systems matching with new branch of physics. I expect a lot of that's pattern matching, and we remember really the rare instances where that happens, we forget all the instances where it doesn't. Mm. <laughs> um, the other thing, so the physics we have at the moment is, it's probably quite accurate for what the actual physics is, but it might, it might be, it's the larger version, there's actually a smaller version of something yeah. else we haven't delved further enough, further enough in. But our physics has to be based off the real world physics, which as far as we're aware is universal. Um, our mathematics doesn't have to be based off the real world. Um, it, it could well be that there are a whole, you know, we run into aliens and they go, well actually, because we had a couple of really bright minds in some other different area, they went off in a whole other direction. And so we've maybe got some little core that's the same, but the, the, the higher end stuff is much, is much more likely to, that there may well be, the, the question is, is how much more mathematics is there, basically. I and, think, yeah, yeah. You know, it's yeah, entirely think possible they, they could have whole areas that we just go, well, we don't, we don't think like that at all. And so that we can I fundamentally believe that prime numbers are universal. Like, they will, you will not find any aliens where prime numbers are universal. Maybe not. It's a it's 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 chaos that we get without primes. I think my, my aliens living in the Celtic gases world, mm. I don't know if they even have numbers. Mm. They might be really good at predicting weather because that's what they're living in. But uh, they might have problems with things that are sort of closely delineated. Mm. So, um, or if they live in a world where sort of there's the multiplicity of things. It's just like in, in the, I think in Solaris, there's this ocean on the planet, which is just one living thing. Um, it, it wouldn't have numbers because it's just one thing. So there's, there's no two things in the world. So. Um, to, to, to references, I think one really nice book is called Why or How the Laws of Physics Lie which is, um, like we have this idea that laws of physics really capture the true sort of nature of the universe, but they're all just approximations. They don't really work precisely. They sort of work pretty good, but they're all, they're all lies. Um, they're very useful lies and very practically sort of functioning lies, but it's not like the world really has sort of um, it's built from these equations um, because they're not exact. Um, and I think that the other thing you mentioned, which, like linking different parts of the mm. pattern matching, um, that's what I think is really interesting about the sort of logic equals lambda calculus equals category theory. Because this is a nice story, but it only works if you pick simply type lambda calculus, you pick intuitionalistic logic and you pick Cartesian closed categories, which are like very sort of specific things in this in this world. So well, yes, sure. Remind me what's the name of the guy who's because I've seen the video the guy. I think Fogler likes likes saying this. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he's arguing that it's true because you know, there, there's some objective truth there. Yeah. Because yeah. because two parallel areas everyone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think this is one possible sort of counter-argument. Yeah. Another one would be sociological, where a lot of sort of all these different three things, they come from different, from the sort of same, from different approaches in the same community to tackle the same problem with sort of same constraints, they just go in a different direction. But, um, it's not that unusual that two disconnected research groups come up with the same idea because there's just a wider society that sort of makes them think the same things. Alright. Well then, should we continue less formally and stop the video and uh, then, we can, then we can talk more about uh, all the personal details.